Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled COVID-19, Total Solutions for Detection and Surveillance. This webinar is part of the ongoing coronavirus virtual webinar series. And I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and sponsored by BGI Americas and MGI Americas. For more information about BGI Americas, go to www.bgi.com backslash US backslash. And for more information about MGI Americas, go to www.mgiamericas.com. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you'd like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. And as a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Simply click on the ed Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. I now present today's speakers, Dr. Pan Zeng, a laboratory director at BGI, and Mr. Sabod Nimkar, a senior product manager at the Complete Genomics Facility of MGI. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the Biography tab at the top of the screen. Starting first, Dr. Pan Zhang, well, you may now present your presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar. My name is Pan Zhang, and I'm the lab director at BGI Americas. Today, I will talk about BGI solutions and efforts to address COVID-19 pandemic. This is the outline of my talk today, which I would like to cover three topics. First of all, I will talk about BGI and give a brief overview of the company and also the current status COVID-19 outbreak. Second, I will focus on BGI's SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR detection kit, which received US FDA UA approval on March 26th. And next, uh, last, I will talk a little bit about the BGI COVID-19 efforts in the press. So who are we? BGI is a world-leading life science organization. It provides a wide range of service to both researchers and clinical uh, professionals with quality genomic data and genetic testing solutions. It was founded in 1999 in order to participate the Human Genome Project, which is considered one of the greatest scientific achievements of last century. It is headquartered in Shenzhen, Guangdong, China. Now BGI has over 6,000 employees worldwide and has provided services to more than 100 countries and regions. BGI also have a track record in fighting infectious disease, especially at the front of diagnosis. BGI is the first to provide HIV AIDS diagnosis in China in 1995. In the 2003 SARS pandemic and 2004 avian flu pandemic, BGI is the first to sequence the virus genome and produce diagnostic kit to detect the pathogen. In 2011 E. coli outbreak, BGI is also the first to sequence the pathogen. In 2014, we helped the detection of Ebola virus in Sierra Leone and in 2020, among the first few companies who developed the COVID-19 detection kit, BGI has produced massive detection kit to help fight the pandemic. This world map shows the current status of COVID-19 outbreak. The color indicates the number of confirmed cases in that particular region and country. As of March 30th, there are 203 countries and regions with confirmed COVID-19 cases. 
and altogether globally, there are 700,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases and related deaths is at 33,000. And all the numbers are still growing. All this information are coming from WHO COVID-19 Situation Report 70. In order to fight, fight this COVID-19 outbreak, WHO put together strategic objectives. This is a very text heavy and busy slide, but I just want to point your attention to those keywords, such as interrupt human to human transmission, identify early, rapid identification, diagnosis, and the management of cases. So it's clear early detection and diagnosis will play a critical role in combat combating the outbreak. In the United States, number of confirmed cases are also growing every day. CDC has published guidelines for patients, healthcare providers, and the laboratory professionals. The information here is from CDC website just to give you a brief overview of COVID-19. Although there is still a lot to be learned for this COVID-19, current thinking is COVID-19 spreads from person to person through respiratory droplets among close contacts. COVID-19 symptoms can range from mild symptoms to severe illness and deaths from confirmed COVID-19 cases, although there are also reports of uh, patients without any symptoms. Usually the symptoms develop in two to 14 days after exposure, those including fever, cough, shortness of breath. For COVID-19 testing, CDC also published criteria to guide evaluation of laboratory testing for COVID-19. CDC also recommends clinicians should use their judgment to determine if a patient has signs and symptoms compatible with COVID-19 and whether the patient should be tested. So it's very clearly outlined by both CDC and FDA that the COVID-19 testing is prescribed by the patient's healthcare provider. CDC also put together a priority list for testing patients with suspected COVID-19 infection. Next, I will talk about our SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR detection kit. This is uh, emergency use of authorization from US FDA, and this is the first page of letter of authorization, as well as our press release about that authorization. I do want to put this disclosure before I talk about the kit in details. So our kit name is Real-Time Fluorescence RT-PCR Kit for Detecting SARS-2019 and COVID. And in the United States, this test is now being FDA cleared or approved and has been authorized at FDA under EOA for use by authorized laboratories and only for detection of nucleic acid from SARS-CoV and under EOA declaration. Prior to FDA EOA approval, our kit detection COVID-19 already received other regulatory approvals. On January 26, China National Medical Products Administration approved four detection kit. BGI's kit is among of uh, is one of them. On February 28, our kids also received CE, IVD, and free sales certificate in for Europe region. Uh, this kit is qualitative detection of SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid by real-time reverse transcription PCR. It targets off one ab of SARS-CoV-2 virus genome. It can detect nucleic acids from patient samples of strep swab and above. The sample will be extracted using CHI-M viral RNA mini kit and reactions run ABI 7500. Each kit contains 50 reactions, which including everything you need for uh, RT-PCR. This is a structure of SARS-CoV-2 genome and uh, also several detection targets that can be used. Uh, in lens, SARS-CoV-2 genome is about 30,000 base pair. It contains several regions, including ORF1AB, S, E, M, and N. 
RF1AB is a huge region, the largest region in the SARS-CoV-2 genome. It's encoding polyproteins. And one of the protein encoded is RNA, dependent RNA polymerase, RDRP. Our target is also on the ORF1AB region, but not RDRP, but it's also a conservative region. Other regions such as S, which for spike protein, E for amyloid protein, as well as N for nucleocapsid protein, uh, can also be used for targets. This is a workflow for the sample preparation all the way to the data analysis. Briefly, it can be divided into three steps. First step is sample preparation, including RNA extraction from patient samples, and then setting up the PCR reaction. This step, assuming everything using taking um, manually, it will take about 50 minutes. After the reaction is set it up, it, will, it can be loaded to 7500 real-time PCR system and running the program. The program itself take about an hour and 25 minutes. After the results coming out, you can start your analysis, and this usually takes 25 minutes or even less once you get used to the data. As indicated previously, uh, we can use two different sample types to detect the nucleic acid of SARS-CoV-2. For lower respiratory tract, we can use valve sample, and for upper respiratory tract, throat swab can be used. The samples then are uh, subject to RNA extraction using chi amp viral RNA minikit. And after extra extraction, the RT-PCR reaction can be set up. This is one step setup so basically the reverse transcription and real-time PCR is take place in the one tube. The component in the kit provide all the necessary reagent for this to happen. So there's four tubes in the kit. There's reaction mix and enzyme mix. The reaction mix contains reagent for amplification, probes, primers for virus target as well as internal reference. The enzyme mix is tech polymerase, reverse transcriptase, and UDG, everything you need for the enzyme to, to, to have the PCR reaction to take place. There is also positive control provided in the kit, which is a mixed solution of pseudovirus or virus-like particles with target virus gene and internal reference. Now, the no template control basically is nucleus-free water. So, it's very simple to set up the PCR reaction. The reaction volume is 30 microliter, including 10 microliter of extracted RNA and 20 microliter of PCR mix. And PCR mix basically the reaction mix and the enzyme mix. So you have everything in the kit, only three components to set up RT-PCR reaction. And the table in the lower is indicating the PCR program you should need to set up for 7500. After the PCR finished, you can uh, start the data analysis. So before you move on to any particular patient sample, the first thing is to uh, determine if the entire ROM pass or fail. So for every single ROM, there should be at least one non-template control and one positive control. So first, look at the non-template control there shouldn't have any amplification, and the positive control also should have very good amplification. Now the cut off value for CT, CT value for internal reference with the big channel is 35, and for FAM channel is 37. So if both criteria are met, then this wrong pass, you can proceed to sample analysis. If non-template control show any amplification, that's indicating of cross-contamination, you should fill the entire run and repeat it. Or if the positive control doesn't have good amplification, that's probably indicating uh, some process error, either the extraction or RT-PCR, then the entire run also needs to be filled, and then you run it, repeat it, uh, run it another time. So after the first QC check, if the entire round pass, you can move on to the sample analysis. Now, the lower table shows you four possible scenarios for any given sample. 
So first thing, look at the internal reference. If you see a good amplification that indicating the sample has a, <clears throat> has a good quality, and if there is FAM channel amplification, that's a positive for SARS-CoV-2, or if there is not, there is a negative. This it is negative for SARS-CoV-2. If you do not have a good internal reference amplification, the sample fail. Regardless, you have FAM amplification or not. This test is invalid, and you should repeat that sample. Okay. So let's talk about the performance of the kit. Uh, first, we look at the limit of detection of the kit. We used the control material to test out the potential limit of detection concentration. As you can see, we use five concentrations, 500, 300, 150, 175 copies per mil of COVID-19. And the number of positive uh, detected in the total number tested test 20 is all 100% until the 70 uh, until 75 copies per mil, which turns to 75%. Now, we decide that that's probably where the LODR for the kit. However, this is control material, so it's always different from clinical samples, and we want to test it with a clinical sample. So the next step, we use clinical patient sample, the throat, one throat swab and two bulk samples, and also do this five different uh, concentration titration. And as you can see, for throat swab at uh, 150, the detection is 19 out of 20. So it's about 95 proportion positive and we define that as the limit of detection for the throat swab is 150 viral uh, copies per mil. Now for both one and two, one sample at 100, uh, 100 copies per mil, we have 100% detection. However, another one showed 19 out of 20. So combined together for the both, we only say the 100 uh, copies per mil is a, is a limited detection. For the specificity and cross-reactivity, we wet tested 54 pathogens, which commonly either commonly found in a respiratory tract or uh, can cause other uh, diseases with similar symptoms to the COVID-19. And we found no cross-reactivity. So this uh, assay is very specific for the coronavirus. Regarding the reactivity and inclusivity, what we did is we used clinical patient samples, which has been confirmed with positive, and we diluted those patient samples into first 5,000 copies per mil, and we have 100% detect, detection rate, and we further diluted down to 100, mil, 100 copies per mil, which is around the limit of detection or even lower, as you can see, for all the bulk sample, we have 100% of detection rate, and only one throat swab uh, has 90% detection rate, which because due to the high uh, 100 uh, mil, uh, copy per mil is actually lower than its um, uh, limit detection concentration. Now, I do want to emphasize this. All this dilution is using an active patient sample, to dilute it down to less copy. So you can imagine everything other than the virus, uh, coronavirus will be in the mixture. However, we can still reliably detect 100 uh, copies per mil at that level. Our kit manufacturer is ISO 13485 compliance. Currently, our manufacturer capacity is at 300,000 tests per day. We're working on ramping it up to 600,000 tests per day, and we believe we can reach that goal very soon. To date, we already manufacture more than 5 million COVID-19 test kit, and BGI lab uh, already performed more than half a million of tests in Shenzhen, Wuhan, and other cities. Internationally, more than 1 million tests has been ordered from 72 countries and regions. We also have a warehouse established in the United States to uh, distribute locally.
Uh, and last, I would like to mention briefly some of the BGI COVID-19 uh, efforts in the press. BGN partners built coronavirus testing lab in Wuhan. You may have heard the fire eye lab concept, and this is also being uh, reported by the genome web. We are very excited by the FDA UA approval for our BGI SARS-CoV-2 detection kit. And very recently, Kansas City business leaders bought 50,000 BGI COVID-19 test kit to help the local uh, medical center to fight the uh, pandemic. Also, BGI donate 1,000 coronal tests to the uh, state of Maryland. BGI also has global donation efforts for coronavirus detection kit. Uh, this effort has been reported by different media outlets, including Genome Web United States. Also, uh, BGI's COVID-19 detection kit uh, is being donated by Chinese government to other countries, such as Philipp Philippines, to help the local government to fight the COVID-19 outbreak. To date, BGI already directly donated about 140,000 coronavirus detection kit and another 200,000 by charity organization procurement. So altogether, about 340,000 BGI coronavirus detection kit has been donated to different regions and countries to fight the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, I believe this slides conclude my talk, and uh, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Zhang, for that presentation. And now I'd like to welcome our second speaker, um, Mr. Nimkar. Welcome, and I'd like you to start your presentation. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Sabod Nimkar and I'm the Senior Product Manager at MGI based in San Jose, California. Today, I would like to introduce you to BGI and MGI's COVID-19 total solutions for detection and surveillance. I will be primarily focusing on sequencing-based surveillance solutions from MGI. Today, I would like to basically take you through BGI and MGI's involvement in COVID-19 detection from day one. So I have laid out the talk in where I will first quickly go through the COVID-19 global status, introduce you to BGI as a group, and our role in testing worldwide. Then, as I mentioned before, I will introduce sequencing surveillance workflows for COVID-19. Then I'll talk about uh, practical considerations for detection and surveillance of COVID-19, and then get into more details about um, what is exactly required to perform COVID-19 detection and surveillance really well to get the best results. And that involves in, um, swap preservation, transport and storage. It involves RNA extraction kits, and of course, the automation to support uh, the current needs. And then I will summarize. As of March 29th, we have roughly 634,800 confirmed cases worldwide and approximately 29,900 deaths. As we are all aware, the pathogen now is officially called COVID-19. Infected people are the primary source or the only source of infection spread and it is spread through respiratory droplets and personal contact. As the epidemic spreads, 
there is possibility of, of mutations in the virus and those need to be uh, tracked. BGI as a group is primarily split into three different uh, organization types. One is the nonprofit, basically focusing on deciphering science. Second is uh, a group of companies or divisions that are focusing on manufacturing and providing uh, solutions around sequencing. And third is pure research groups. In the first category, we have um, BGI College, which is basically for educating young workforce on genomics. Second is Chinese National Gene Bank, which is owned by Chinese government, but operated by MGI. And then Giga Science Journal, which is a peer-reviewed journal uh, managed by uh, and published by BGI. In the second group of companies, uh, which are involved in industrial activity and providing solutions, MGI, which is manufacturing all sequencing instruments and reagents and kits. Then we have FGI, which is forensic group providing forensic services. And then in the pure research in life sciences, we have BGI health and an agriculture business. BGI has been involved in COVID-19 detection and surveillance from day one. We sequenced uh, first COVID-19 genome in collaboration with a lab in Wuhan, built and operate are still operating a lab uh, in Wuhan. BGI offers both real-time PCR tests and MGI sequencing and both were deployed in, in China. And so far, we have performed about over 1 million tests in over 60 countries and the numbers are rapidly growing. Very early COVID-19 genome sequencing. Basically, the workflow that was used earlier on was um, collection of swabs, extract samples, and then do library preparation as we do normally for, for sequencing, perform sequencing, and then bioinformatics analysis. MGI's proprietary DNBC technology that is implemented on all DNBC platform uh, was used for sequencing. For bioinformatics platform, BGI and MGI's pipeline was used. And in brief, basically the raw data was processed and first by doing quality control of the data, filter data, plus the, the sequences obtained against NCBI databases and identify consensus or similarity between the sequences, extract reads, uh, identify contexts, scaffolds, and build the whole genome sequence. The first genome sequence was done around December 22nd. The NBC G400 was used. Seven patient samples with severe pneumonia. Six were vendors and shippers in Wuhan seafood market. PCR was first performed using pan-COV primers that showed five positives. MPS, or massively parallel sequencing, de novo assembly showed about 87% sequence similarity with SARS-CoV. De novo assembly and targeted PCR basically showed 29,891 base pair for coronavirus genome with about 79.5% sequence homology with SARS-CoV. Seven non-structural proteins common to SARS coronavirus 
basically suggested it is a SARS associated virus. The sequence blasted uh, against NCBI database showed that genes that produce viral surface glycoproteins S are particularly different between COVID-19 and other SARS family related viruses. We did some more suspected samples uh, and, in, and this time we use DNBC T7 platform, a much higher throughput platform because the need was increasing. And this was primarily to explore origins of the virus. This was done around January 5th. Nine BAF samples were sequenced. Over 99.9% .9 genome sequences were same for eight samples. Only four SNPs uh, were found between the two samples, WH19002 and WH02. This basically indicated that the virus may come from the same source in a relatively short period of time. Shanghai Public Health Clinical Center in Afudan University then submitted sequences to NCBI around January 13th and, and identified ORFs that are primarily of interest to identify the COVID-19 genome. Uh, and this data was used now routinely to do sequencing based genome analysis. Further, we also needed to put more instruments to meet the demand. So we had DNBC G50 instrument also used around January 21st. And, and the de novo assembly using DNBC G50. And in this case, sequencing was done using single end 100, about 300 million reads generated. Uh, and about 2.5 million reads from COVID-19. The de novo assembly using IDBA basically generated the same uh, data with the whole genome sequence of about 29.9 kilobytes, basically indicating all the three platforms that we, we used for COVID-19 sequencing basically generated similar data and and worked quite efficiently under these stressful conditions. Now going forward, um, there were different sequencing surveillance workflows that have emerged. And, and we wanted to compare these different approaches. Min Feng Xiao at, at BGI led a re the research on this comparative study. The goal was to really validate bias, sensitivity, inter-individual variance, and intra-individual accuracy. Eight patient samples, throat, nasal, anal swabs, and sputum were used in this work. Also some cultures were used and culture dilutions were employed to identify uh, the performance of these different approaches. Three different approaches that were used were amplicon sequencing, metascriptomics, and hybridization capture. For amplicon sequencing, patient samples were processed using Adoplex panel, and PCR primers used uh, were basically about 300 to 400 base pair. For culture samples, about 100 to 200 base pairs. Sequencing was done using DNBC G400 using single end 400 uh, sequencing. For metascriptomics, DNBC T7 was used and paired, paired end 100 sequencing was performed. 
For same thing for hybridization capture, DNBC G400 and paired and 100 sequencing. For a hybridization capture, bokeh panel probes and blockers were used. This is really the high level workflow for these three approaches employed. For metascriptomic and, and hybridization, the workflow is very similar. In brief, host DNA-free RNAs were fragmented, double-stranded cDNA synthesized, library prep, uh, which included end repair, adapter ligation and amplification were performed, samples were dual indexed, and then MGI's uh, proprietary patented technology of uh, circularization, rollers, rolling circle replication, and DNB making was used to prepare samples for sequencing using pair and 100 sequencing. Same approach, very similar for uh, capture hybridization, or sorry, hybridization capture was used using the bokeh panel. All the steps up to library prep were similar. Uh, but after that, the DNA RNA were captured using the panel and then circularization, rolling circle replication and DNB making, followed by pair and 100 sequencing. Amplicon based enrichment workflow using Adoplex uh, panel was following. Total RNA was reverse transcribed. Genome amplification was done using full length genome amplicon panel. Two steps of PCR uh, product uh, generation and amplification. Single stranded DNA was obtained, and then the standard library prep process was done, and single end 400 sequencing performed. This work is all published in Ming. Min Feng Xiao's paper at BioArchive. The data processing for metascriptomics and hybridization capture was very similar. First pass identification of candidate viral reads was done by processing all reads by aligning with coronaviridae genomes, basically a combination database of three genomes SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. Further qualification was done by removing low quality reads, duplicates, and adapter contamination. Then the data was cleaned up further by removing low complexity reads. This generated COVID-19-like reads. The data was then further subsampled to only 100x coverage or more, and then the de novo assembly was done using spades. For amplicon based sequencing, low quality reads were removed and adapter sequences were removed. And this was done on the single end 400 reads uh, using FASTP. Further qualification was done. Basically, in this step, uh, primer sequences and 21 base upstream and downstream of the primers were trimmed. The clean reads obtained were used for downstream analysis. Amplicon sequencing generated an uneven read coverage. Pylon then was used to generate virus consensus sequence and positions with depth 100x or lower or 5x lower than the negative control marked as ambiguous or ends. The conclusion and the guidance from Min Feng's work is really captured in this slide. Based on the work uh, published, if the goal of the study is to, to study genetic materials in addition to the target viruses, 
Metascriptomics is probably the better approach. If the goal is to study virus diversification due to recombinational events, again, metascriptomics is probably a better approach. And if the viral load in RNA samples is higher than 1 e10 to the power 5 copies per ml or CT value lower than 24 and a half, then metascriptomics is a better approach. If the study goal is, is to do intra-individual variations, particularly when the concentrations are lower than 1 e10 to the power 5 per ml, or CT values more than 24 and a half, then hybridization capture probably works best. And then lastly, if the goal is to identify SNVs, particularly when the concentrations are low, lower than 1 e10 to the power 2 per ml, or CT values as high as 35, Amplicon-based uh, approach is likely to give the best results. MGI works with several partners who have expertise in different uh, approaches. We work with Paragon Genomics, also for Amplicon panel, and Twist for hybridization capture. And as you can see from their application notes published, their performance um, is, is in line with what we have seen in our comparative study. Clearly, the panels used in that comparative, list, comparative study are different here, and uh, the performance when employing these two different approaches using different panels uh, may be different. <clears throat> Another exciting Amplicon-based approach was recently developed by Dr. Howard Salas at Pennsylvania State University. This approach combines RT-PCR and massively parallel sequencing. The, the big difference here is an extremely high level of multiplexing. About 19,200 samples can be multiplexed and sequenced in one run. So the, the workflow is something like this. Swaps collected, RNA is extracted. All these RNA samples are, are barcoded, then reverse transcribed. The barcoded cDNA samples are then pooled, PCR amplified, then libraries prepared, sequencing is done, and then bioinformatics analysis. The key to this approach is computationally designed roughly 57,600 RT primers with highly unique barcode sequences that link samples to cDNA products across three amplicons that are recommended by CDC, N1, N2 SARS-CoV-2, and RNAs P human control. Uh, we are working with Dr. Salas to, to, to evaluate the approach on DNBC platforms. And as the data becomes available, we will be presenting that uh, in the near future. Now, coming to the practical considerations of, of detection and, and surveillance. As we know, the swabs need to be collected at hospitals and collection sites. They need to be transported. And then in the central lab, the extraction, real-time PCR prep, and real-time PCR happens, and the results are generated. If you are a sequencing lab, then the same thing, the swabs need to be transported to uh, the central lab, which does extractions, library prep, and sequencing, and bioinformatics analysis. Maintaining swab sample integrity is key. And that is because 
it directly impacts the performance of uh, the RT-PCR and sequencing and, res and results in either top quality diagnosis or poor quality. The primary challenge for storing, preserving is, is the fact that the samples contain DNAs and RNAs that can degrade the RNA of interest or swamp RNA of interest. So maintaining the, the levels of RNA that were in the original samples are critical. The transport and storage conditions can exacerbate the degradation. So in order to, to address this, we offer uh, the swap preservation transport and storage tube that basically has about 2 ml of formulation that stabilizes the collected swab. Extraction is the next key step and MGI offers RNA extraction kits that are basically magnetic bead based DNA and RNA uh, extraction from cell free samples. These are tested thoroughly with nasopharyngeal and throat swabs, valve, saliva, serum, plasma and culture medium samples. The extraction is compatible with RT-PCR and sequencing, and it is also compatible with high throughput automation solution that we offer. Here's one data set that compares uh, extraction efficiency of MGI and a competitor. And as you can see here, the CT values for MGI are, are lower than the competitor values, demonstrating that uh, it has a better extraction efficiency. For automation, MGI offers uh, two different platforms, MGISP100 and MGISP960. They primarily differ in their throughput. MGISP100 does about 100 samples a day. MGISP960 can do about 500 samples a day. They have all the features required to do extractions and library prep on board. And these are extensively field tested uh, because of the, the fact that these were deployed in Wuhan right at the early stage of COVID-19 outbreak. Just an example of uh, DMBC T7 workflow to give you an idea about the time it takes to, to do the sequencing. It's basically about 20 hours for 108 samples, or sorry, 128 samples from samples to report. Uh, at each step, MGI offers uh, a particular product, as we talked about extraction. Uh, for library prep, we offer MGI as a lib RNA library prep sets, and for automation, automation systems, sequencer, and then at the end for bioinformatics, a pathogen infections identification server and software. Uh, as I already talked about, these are the three or four systems that we offer to do COVID-19 surveillance. And they primarily differ based on their, their throughput and a number of reads and turnaround time. Uh, all of these systems have been extensively used for COVID-19. In the end, uh, MGI basically offers all the, the products and solutions required to perform uh, a COVID-19 surveillance in the best possible manner to deliver uh, a top quality results. So to summarize, I hope I have convinced you that BGI and MGI have gained very early valuable insights into COVID-19 genome. With our experience right from the beginning and the products and the solutions that we have deployed, we are in a very good position to, to support initiatives 
in uh, COVID-19 detection and surveillance. We, and this is through our products for RNA extractions, automation, swap reservation, and the three different sequencing approaches that we support on DNBC platforms. Our experience and the products that we offer, I think BGI is in the best position to, to supply robust total solution for COVID-19 detection and surveillance. Thank you. And thank you, Pan and Thibault, for that informative presentation. And we will now start the Q&A portion of this webinar. And if you have any questions, audience members, you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll get started. So we have quite a few questions already coming in. And Thibault, I'll actually start with you. Um, let's see. Our first audience member would like to know, are the swab tubes extraction kits um, and automation available now? Yes. All the three products uh, that you just mentioned, uh, they are available. And uh, as far as the automation goes, uh, there are two systems, MGI SP100 and MGI SP960 which basically differ in their throughput. Wonderful, thank you. And I'll switch back and forth. Pan, here's a question for you. Is your test use TACMAN technology with primers and probe or other technology? Um, yes, uh, our kit is actually using TACMAN technology. Thank you. And Sabode? Do you do sequencing for every sample? So if the question is um, about what we did in, in Wuhan, most of the work, or the sequencing work was initially doing um, a sequencing of the genome and then trying to monitor uh, how, how the growth is and whether there are any mutations. So the short answer is no. Primary testing was done using uh, real-time PCRs. Thank you for that. And, and um, kind of continuing with tests, so are the 1M tests performed by BGI use RT-PCR or sequencing? Yeah, uh, most of those tests were done using RT-PCR. Thank you. And again, thank you for these great questions coming in from our audience. We have over 40 questions coming in. And any questions that are not answered today, we will be answering them via email by our presenters. Pan, what is, is in your positive control? Um, so the positive control provided in the kit is actually uh, considered what we call pseudovirus or virus-like particles. So it's um, target virus RNA in the protein code and also target uh, internal um, reference in the protein code. So it's actually you can take it through extraction and through all the way RT-PCR. So it serves extraction control as the RT-PCR control. And, and Pan, what is the volume of the reaction? Um, the reaction volume is 30 microliter for uh, each sample. And uh, you, so basically, it's only one reaction has to be set up for uh, each patient sample. OK, thank you very much. And um, regarding samples, does your assay monitor sample degra degradation? Uh, yes, uh, so we have internal reference, which is uh, targeting human beta actin, one of the housekeeping gene. So it is in the same reaction tube, the duplex. So you will be able to tell uh, if you can detect the uh, human beta actin to tell if the sample are still in good quality. 
And then the next step you can look at the FAM, uh, FAM which is the virus channel of the posture negative. So yes, it's actually in, uh, implemented in the test uh, region. Thank you. And I'll switch back to Sabode. What is the composition of the 2ML formulation used to preserve the swab sample? Yeah, very good question. Um, I, I don't have all the details of the, the formulation, but at a higher level, I would say that it, it does have uh, chemicals to prevent uh, DNAs and RNAs degradation. So basically inhibitors, and then there are some other components that that maintain the sample integrity as much as possible at two to eight degrees Celsius. Thank you. And well, I can provide the details later. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say that uh, I can certainly uh, provide the details uh, offline. Wonderful. And are the three sequencing approaches, um, metatranscriptomics, HYB capture, and amplicon to both? Um, so I'm not very clear about uh, the question, but, but we, MGI on the NBC platform we do support these three approaches, and depending on on the the objective of the lab, a certain approach may be more um, more appropriate than the other. And again, another difference between these three approaches is the the throughput that one can achieve uh, by using these three approaches. So, amplicon sequencing. Uh, probably has the highest throughput followed by the hybridization capture and and then uh, the transcriptomics. And when I say throughput, I mean the whole, uh, that includes sample prep, library prep, sequencing, and uh, data processing. Thank you for that. And Pan, what is, a, uh, what is about cross reactivity with other coronaviruses like SARS and MERS? Uh, this is a very good question. So actually, at the beginning, when we were developing our assay, we actually did both in silico and wet lab testing. So uh, so we wet lab tested the SARS and MERS, and there's no cross activity with our assay. Thank you. And did you use clinical samples or RNA controls for your validation study, Pan? Uh, so we actually use clinical sample for all of our clinical evaluation. So uh, we don't use RNA control as our uh, evaluation tool. So thank you for that. And we have a couple minutes for a few more questions. And I just want to remind audience members: thank you so much for all of your questions. Any questions not answered will be answered via email. Pan, I'll give you one more, and then Sabode. Um, Pan, do you have uh, what? What are the challenges that you encountered during developing the test? So we actually, so as Dora actually alluded to, that we actually have sequencing uh, capacity in our uh, R&D Alpha Clinical Lab. So at the beginning, uh, I will say the first challenging is to get to know the sequence of the virus and to make sure you select the right target and test it out to make sure there's no cross activity and to also maintain the sensitivity. So that is the first challenge, but uh, since we have this capability, so we, we get it down at, at least very fast. The second one I would say is more challenging for the current developer in the US and other countries that uh, a lot of clinical validation, which is very important to evaluate the assay's clinical performance, is that you prefer to use clinical samples, the real clinical samples, to, to detect if you can tell there is a coronavirus uh, infection or not. I know it's a little bit difficult to obtain at, at this point in here. We, uh, at that time, we, ha we have a collaborator clinical laboratories, so we have early access to the sample and then uh, get it, all the clinical evaluation done. So that's, I think, the major uh, two challenges that uh, any developer should uh, probably going to face. 
at this point. Thank you for that. And so, Bode, here's a final question for you. What are, and actually it's a two-part question, what are all the practical advantages of having sequence data as opposed to RT-PCR data? And the second part is, I know you can use the sequence data to trace the geographic spread of the virus, but what else can learn, we learn from the sequence data? Sure, great question. Um, it, as I alluded to in my talk, the, the sequencing is really ideally suited for surveillance, meaning we are, if some, we are interested in monitoring the mutations. We are interested in, as, as was pointed out in the question, geographic spread of the virus. Practically, it can also be used for detection. But practically, the sequencing is like suited for surveillance, where you have large number of samples that can that need to be analyzed or sequenced, but there is no real time pressure because the the sequencing sequencing takes significantly longer than real time PCR. So let's say it takes about uh, 20 hours to from sample to report, but as as I showed, there are approaches that that do that show the potential to do something like 20,000 samples in one sequencing run. So the practical advantage is definitely in the area of surveillance, where you are collecting samples on a routine basis to monitor what's going on in the population and, and do it very cost effectively. <clears throat> thank you, Pan, and thank you, Sabod. Do you have any final comments for our audience before we close today? Maybe Pan, I'll let you go first. Uh, sure. So I know there's more questions coming up, so um, probably just not enough time to allow to answer those questions. Um, but thank you for all you listened to this, and and really appreciate the lab group to organize this event. It's very helpful. So we'll try we'll we'll try to get answer all the questions through the email after the event. So please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or any further information about the RT-PCR kit. Also, the RT-PCR kit is FDA EUA approved. So if you visit the FDA website, uh, there will be uh, information on our uh, kit as well. So this is my, uh, uh, my comment, comment. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pan. And Sabot? Yeah, thank you. As far as sequencing goes, um, MGI as a company is looking for a research partners slash collaborators to deploy these um, exciting sequencing approaches that include uh, extreme high throughput sequencing using uh, Amphicon based approaches as well as uh, hybridization capture. And of course, the transcriptomics, if the, the interest is for monitoring mutations in viruses and geographic origins. So if there is any interest in the research labs, uh, please reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Pan, and thank you both for your time today and for your very important research. And before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors, BGI Americas and MGI Americas, for sponsoring today's webinar. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of the registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand through the end of this year, 2020. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share this email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, bye-bye, and please be safe and healthy out there. Thank you. Thank you.